Hey, we need to keep, um, I, I want to pray at the end of service today. Um, <clears throat> we've got several people we need to pray for. <clears throat> Sister Delana is in the hospital, and we're praying for her. And we want to pray for uh, Linda Sloan's granddaughter, Devin. So we'll make sure, we'll, we're going to pray at the end of service. All right, Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for worship today. Thank you for the word that Evelyn and Jeff gave, Lord. Father, I pray that the word of God comes forth out of my mouth today to help somebody. We've been praying about it, Lord. I take authority over every harassing spirit, Lord, every demonic spirit that's come to harass this congregation. For me, I take authority over it in Jesus' name and rebuke it. Lord, let your word come forth in power and anointing. Open our hearts and minds to hear it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jason, it's always good to have you. You gave that word about glory, right? I get the message today is the image and the glory. And I got a book called Glory. He said the glory of God is in his goodness, right? So I'm going to give this to you, brother, so... That's why Arthur blessed it. It's just a bunch of scriptures on the glory of God. So it's good stuff. So just to show you were hearing from the Lord on that. It's good stuff. We've been in a series on salvation and what salvation is. And I know a part of salvation, and I really look at it, salvation, uh, going to heaven is a part of salvation. People say they're saved. And w when you say you're saved, how many people think I'm going to heaven? Is that what you think? Anybody? Yeah, that's part of it. I like someone said that's a benefit of salvation. I like that. It's a benefit of salvation. If you're not saved now, you're not getting the benefits. When you get hired by uh, IBM, I suppose they have benefits, right? But you get a job to do, right? You get a badge. It says you belong to IBM. And then they give you a benefit package. Well, one of the benefits of salvation is that we get to go spend eternity with Jesus, it sure beats the other option. Amen? I know they don't preach the other option everywhere, but, but that's one of the benefits. But salvation is the, we've been preaching, is the God is restoring us back to our original intention, back to our original design, and back to our original purpose. In the beginning, man was created in the image of God. And I, like I said, I put down the scriptures here. I feel like the Lord uh, shares with me that there's a strong, sometimes there's a strong spirit of unbelief in people. It's not like people want not to believe. Maybe sometimes could be religious training and indoctrination on religion. But people struggle with what the gospel was really saying. And I know I do. This, just this week, I don't know, and maybe I'm unusual, but I had a night, it, it seemed like I was wrestling with something evil all night long in my sleep. Has that ever happened to anybody else? And, has it? And I'll tell you what, it was like a spirit of unbelief. And what do you mean? Like I wake up and it's like, when I wake, when I wake up and something's telling me nothing's going to work out and you know, this person's not going to get healed and this isn't going to happen, and I'm just wrestling with it. And so um, the Lord is, is showing me, or he is teaching me, Brad, if that stuff is attacking you, it's probably attacking your congregation. And so you probably should be praying against it because maybe, maybe this stuff is coming at me because it's coming at you, and I need to be praying against it. Just wrestling. Like I'm, you know, we don't wrestle flesh and blood, right? You know what I mean? So I said, well, if I'm wrestling with it, and I'm in the Word all the time, how much more will our people wrestle but one of the things when I started teaching on salvation and being restored back to the original image, I just felt like there were waves of unbelief, not necessarily from you particularly, but just coming, coming back at me, fighting with me, uh, people not believing the gospel. We are created in the image of God, and we're designed for so much more than what we can imagine or believe. Man has fallen, and because he's fallen, he's fallen into sin. And the image of man's degradated. Sin is degradation. We get tempted to sin, and uh, the Bible talks about sin being pleasurable. Sin does entice. 
and it's pleasurable for a minute, but the wages of sin is always death. It always mars the image, doesn't it? If a man goes out and cheats on his wife and sleeps with another woman, it just mars, it soils him, it destroys his wife, it destroys his family, and it mars the image that God has of what a husband is supposed to be. Amen? You can't feel good about it. Of course, your wife wouldn't feel good about it, and vice versa if those things happen. If a person goes out and uh, you're young and got a lot of strength and energy and start drinking and maybe drugs slip in, it's a lot of fun at the beginning, right? You enjoy yourself. Everybody's hooping it up. Everybody's laughing, but there's nothing sadder than a 50-year-old man that never gave up the alcohol and never gave up the drugs. Look at the end of what people are doing and the destruction. God forbid if you should die in a car wreck from a DUI. Amen? It mars the image. And, and, and sin always mars the image. And that's what Satan, the Bible says that he came to steal, kill, and destroy. And because you are made in the image of God, it's you he wants to destroy. We hear this week a young lady we know about that's really into some depression, suicidal I've prayed with many people, and I was praying at a church here recently. A, a young girl had a suicidal spirit on her. And young girl, beautiful, the whole future in front of her, smart, intelligent, pretty. It would seem like everything is... How many of you that are over 50 would like to be look like you were 20 again and have your future in front of you? You know, uh, just everything. And yet, somehow... The enemy of our soul twists things and turns things through lies and manipulation and deception where a, a young lady would want to take her own life. I'm telling you, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have ever had a spirit or a thought of suicide that you knew it was coming from the outside of you, but you just wanted to give up? Anybody? You don't have to. Yeah. Well, I'll bet you, if honestly, there'd probably be twice as many. Those things oftentimes, folks, are spirits. They come in to deceive us and lie to us. Now, we can shut the door on the devil. And you need to shut the door on the devil because he is real. And he is like a roaring lion. And he is trying to pounce on you. And he comes knocking at your door. And anything you allow him in to your life, he'll come in. You know how the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3. I got some good news today. I don't want to talk about the devil. The devil doesn't really have any power over you than what you give him. Amen? He comes knocking at your door, and he wants to see if you'll take the bait. Hey, did God say this? God lied to you. God's trying to rob you of a good time. He doesn't want you having fun, or those Christians are fuddy. That Whatever the devil uses in your life tries to lie to you because he wants to mar the image. And I really believe sickness, and we know it is sickness, is the marring of the image. Got people in the congregation, you know, sick, and sometimes they're younger. And you can't tell me it's God's will for a child of God, for God to come in and mar the image in a person by making them sick. God's trying to destroy them, to negate them, to renounce them. I don't believe it. I'm not saying you can't open the door to those things in your life, but that's not God's perfect will for our lives. He's not in the business if you want to look at God, and it's in my text here a couple different times, if you want to look at God, what God's really like, we see God in the face of Jesus. And Jesus went around restoring people. I talked about that, you know, a few weeks back. Jesus was always restoring. If Jesus had his way, he'd restore your marriage. He would restore your health. He would restore you and put in, and what he wants to do ultimately is to restore you back to the original design and purpose. We talked about how when we're born again, that Christ begins to, he, he actually comes and lives inside of us, and God begins to work. Now, I understand and I know it doesn't happen all at once. There is a transformation process. And I give a lot of grace on a lot of things because I know, and I've seen it in my life and other people's lives, that God meets us where we're at. Jesus always meets us right where we're at. I've preached it many times. But this transformation process begins to happen, and it stretches on into eternity. And I want to go over it one more time before I go on, because if we don't lay this basis, and we don't understand who we really are, 
You can't grow. If you don't know who you really are, if you think, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, well, you know, you were a sinner and you were saved by grace and apart from God, you're nothing but a sinner. I know that, but you have been remade and refashioned in the image of God. God now, Evelyn, you taught, you said today, and there's dozens of scriptures on it, that we are literally the temple of God. That's pretty precious. You know how they adorn those temples? I don't mind if you get dressed up and come to church, put a little makeup on. That temple looked pretty good. They put diamonds on it. They had gold on it. Amen. Acacia wood. They put rubies, uh, uh, rubies and pearls, and they made it. Be, come on in. Dress up. Put some makeup on. Put a nice coat on. The temple looked good back there. They put a lot of money into that temple. Some of you go out on a Friday night and put on the dough. You can come in here and look good. You're the temple. There's nothing wrong with that. Because you are literally the temple of God. That old thing was just a type and a shadow. It was only for a time. God's done with it. We are now, the church is the temple of God. That's who you are. That's what the Bible says. I got to say, before I get too much further, I almost wanted to load off and start with this. I understand it's all in Christ. I'm not saying it's because you're this or you're, you know, uh, like you said today, it's like you know, Evelyn said, God uses broken people. I'm not saying we're walking in perfection. I'm not saying you're doing it on your own. I understand it is all in Christ. But where are you? You're in Christ. Someone said, if you're not impressed about who you are, you need to look at Jesus again. You're in him. And it's funny because that's in the scriptures <clears throat> over 130 times that's in the scriptures about being in him. And I don't think all of us still believe it, that you're literally <clears throat> in Christ. Christ is the cornerstone in this building we call the church, in the temple, and we're all members of it, a part of this great temple. When we begin to see who we really are, and I mean it like you, you want sin to lose its temptation in your life, you want sin to lessen in your life, if you start realizing who you are, sin doesn't seem so attractive. I, I had a dream about smoking cigarettes here recently. I think I watched a movie and they were smoking, you know, <sighs> spitting it out. And I had a dream, but I said, why did I have that dream? Well, I watched a movie with cigarettes in it. You want to have bad dreams, just watch bad things, I guess, right? But you know, to me, I used to smoke. I was a Marlboro man. Can you see me with my Stetson hat on and my cowboy boots? <laughs> Makes you unhealthy. But I used to smoke. And when I got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, God ripped it out of me. I would no more want to put a cigarette in my mouth than the man on the moon. That's disgusting to me. And I would not want to kiss... Now, if you smoke, I'm not really... I'm really <laughs> I'm not bashing sick. I'm not. I'm just telling you me. I don't want to put that stuff. I had a dream about it. It makes me gag. Think. Maybe that's why my, my voice is a little hoarse this morning. I smoked that cigarette in my dreams. I'd rather than kiss a woman with cigarette. Are you kidding me? I, the whole idea of cigarettes grosses me out, but I used to be the biggest smoker around. I'd go drink and I'd have three packs in one night. Every, every beer I had, I had like four cigarettes or something. I lived a wild and crazy life. Don't live like I did. You can follow me now, Braden, but don't follow who I was. When I, was I, went, I took a wrong turn somewhere in my life. And I'm just, what I'm saying is if you smoke, I mean, you know, I, I'm not trying to put you down for it. I just hate it. I, and I would no more want to go into a strip bar and watch a bunch of girls dancing around than the man on the moon. It would be out of place. It wouldn't fit for me. I'm not saying my eyeballs you know, may not want to look at a girl or something. I'm a normal man, but I would be so out of place. I would be so uncomfortable. It just doesn't fit anymore. And as we grow in God and we are transformed into the image of Christ, you're going to find if you choose to grow in the Lord and move on, there are going to be many things that just fall off of your life just by being in God's presence because they just don't fit anymore. 
I can tell you, and I, and I mean this sincerely, I can't even imagine screaming at my wife. I can't imagine. I, there's men that do that. Scream at their wives. If I did it, I promise it would be five seconds, one minute or something, and I would have to go tell her I'm sorry. And I'll tell you why I would tell her I'm sorry immediately. It doesn't fit. It's very, it, it just doesn't fit my life anymore. I can't believe people do that. Or call each other, call your wife a name. Are you kidding? When we are transformed, okay, okay. Some of you are saying, well, you know, I'm just human. <laughs> you don't know my wife. <laughs> she told me, I don't know you. <laughs> Amen? Uh, okay, 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 okay. Can you imagine Christ calling your wife a name? Can you imagine Jesus calling your wife a name? Who lives inside you? Who do you walk in? Who do you follow? Whose image are you being conformed to? It don't fit, folks. It don't fit. Now, when we grow in this, the Christ, this is going to be like a Mike Tyson you know, left hook to some of you. But when you grow, and I like boxing, by the way. I'll just throw that out there. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a human being, but it's like a Mike Heisen left hook, unbelief and doubt start falling off of our life. It begins to be unnatural to, to be doubting God. Now, I'm not saying initially, I had that dream. I was wrestling with the devil of unbelief. Nothing's going to work out. Just every, everything negative. You know, everything negative coming in. Going to have another, oh, going to have a, another, a bad season in your life. Kids aren't working out. This isn't, the, my husband doesn't like me. Job's not working. Unbelief rules. I don't know if I really believe in God. I don't know if God's going to answer my prayers. <clears throat> Unbelief can roll in on us. I understand that. But as we grow in God into a relationship with God, and we are renewed in his image, even unbelief can start falling off of your life. It becomes unnatural for you not to believe. Do you know how you learn to trust somebody? I, I know, you know, I look at this couple right here, Gary and Kelly, you know, I know you love each other, you got your arm around your wife, and you love her, and I know you're good to her. You know, you guys have a relationship, and you've gotten to know her, and you know you can trust her, and she knows she can trust you. It's by spending time together. It's by relying on that person and getting to know that person. After you get to know them to a certain extent, you know who they are. You know their character. You can put your trust in them. That is the same with God. If you value your relationship with God, it actually would become a very unholy thing to start not believing God in your life. And I've said this so many times recently, but it's so true. I'm getting to the place, I'd rather die believing God than to live in unbelief. And I'm not kidding. I really, really believe, and do you, that God is? Who really believes that God is? Who believes that the Bible, I'm not saying my interpretation of it, I'm just saying the Bible is the word of God. Really believe that then we ought to be burrowing into that book and finding out what, who God is, and we ought to be learning to trust Him. Somebody, I think me and Sister Soleil were talking today. I have a Thursday night uh, teaching I'm doing on Thursdays. It's on the, what is that, Grace Point Utica on YouTube? I think my Thursday night video had one view so far. <laughs> I'm breaking records on my Thursday night videos. <laughs> That's one of those things, I see one view and I wake up, nobody cares what you say. Well, you know, you got a point there. <laughs> Someone cares. Somebody cares. That, that stuff humbles you. It's good to be humble. That's another part of my message. Humility is very good for us because everything is through and from Christ. I got one of my messages on Thursday night, and Soleil and I were talking about this. Guys, one of them is called Faith is Movement. When it comes out on Thursday night, you should at least, of all the 100 messages, listen to that one. And I've even made them 10 minutes long, or 12, right, Brian? We're making them about 10 to 14 minutes long, because we know you guys can only take about that much, right? <laughs> no. 
It's for the, those that have a short attention span. But one of my messages, faith is movement, because when we begin to believe God and we begin to renew our minds and we begin to find out who we are, we can start walking on what God says about us. We can start walking on the word. We can start trusting God. The, the word calls us, when we're first born again, we're babies. We're just babies. We're just like, you may be 50 or 60 years old, but if you just came to Jesus, you're like a baby. And you're crying for that milk. And I want to give it to you. You know, Brad, wax, you know, here, you need some milk, you know, <laughs> what's that commercial about milk, you know, I need to see more milk rings on your mouth when you come in, no, we, as babies, we need milk, I still drink milk, I'm an adult, I still drink milk, you get older, you start, you know, getting a little of that Gerber's toddler food, and you start peas, and you put peas and ham in it, Mom might, she's good to you, might ground up some hamburger and throw that in there for you, but as you grow, your diet changes, and you begin to grow in Christ, and you begin to be able to eat meat, and you get stronger, and more and more things fall off your life. Why? Because God is restoring you back to that original image. He's bringing it about. It's already perfected in Christ, Colossians 2.10, 2, but walking it out takes motion. And if we're not walking, we're really not being transformed. You will be. In ages to come, you will be transformed into that image. Folks, we can be now. I, did it, is there a handout in the bulletin today? I, you ought to read that. I just, the Lord really pummeled me with that this week, and I wrote it out. But our transformation, folks, a lot of times we think this transformation, we fight in the flesh, and we war in the flesh. Folks, we don't grow in the flesh, and we don't war in the flesh. Everything in the kingdom of God is the opposite. I was running down the bike trail. Sister Soleil and I were uh, on the bike trail last, last night in Mount Vernon, and I was running down the trail, and I was on the far right-hand side, and I'm running, and there's this old guy walking right at me, and I'm on the right side. Now, how does it work when you pass somebody? How does that work? If you're on the right, you go, and if, the guy, if you're on the right, then that guy should go where? left. That's kind of how we do it, right? So I'm coming at this guy. He ain't going anywhere. And I mean, I'm just, I'm going right toward him. And I'm literally, I probably got, I'm like, and I'm not, I don't try to be egotistical or think I'm going to knock the guy over, but I'm running. I think, is he going to move? And I'm I'm just going to find out if he's going to move. Normally I just step aside. That cat didn't move. So I'm like right in front of him like this. And all of a sudden I got a big smile on my face. I said, are we playing chicken? And then I stepped off to the right, of course. I, I could have put my hands out. Be a football guy. But I went to the right. I'm a runner. I, I don't, I'm not tackling. And I went around him, and I was laughing. I'm like, oh, he wasn't going to move. And so Lay actually said she had an encounter with him, too. So it was funny. I'm like, and then on the way back, I'm coming back, and I saw him in about 100 yards away. I just got over, and because uh, I run on the same side both ways. And I, that's because that way I don't... Uh, my feet and wear my shoes out wrong. That's why I do that. So I plus my legs. When I use my legs, I always go on the same side both ways. Anyway, she's a runner. So I'm. Uh, that was for her and I. So anyway, I'm I'm coming at him again, and I I just got over and I had a big smile on my face and he actually laughed and we, we came by and I I think I had my earplugs in. I think he says, "Don't play chicken with me," and he was laughing. This guy, <laughs> and I'm like, "Okay, dude." I'll bring it up because I want to be humble, right? I really, I don't want to have pride and ego. Everything in the kingdom of God works just the opposite as it does in the natural. You want to grow, you want to increase, you want to be more significant, then you become the servant of all. If you want to be great in the kingdom, then you become less. It works just the opposite of the world. You want God to exalt you, humble yourself. If you ever... Get in a situation where you can humble yourself. Understand this, that God will use that situation to exalt you. If you choose to humble yourself in any situation, the Bible says God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Jesus said, if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. Right? Everything in the kingdom. Jesus said in uh, Matthew 5, 39, he said, resist not evil. Resist not evil. Jesus was teaching us a totally different way of living. It's a spiritual life. 
But the good news is, folks, we actually win the battle by employing spiritual weapons. It's not that you lose. You don't humble yourself to lose the battle. You don't put down your sword to lose the battle. You actually win the battle by being humble. Because God gives grace to the humble, and who does he resist? The proud. And I've seen that many times, and I've given you many examples in my life. I could right now rattle off five or six examples of in my life when rather than pick up a natural weapon, I decided to do the battle in the spirit. I said, okay, God, I'm going to do this your way, and I can promise you every time I battled in the spirit and I followed the Lord, I actually won the battle. I've had some recently. I won the battle. I had a thing with a, uh, a family thing not, not long ago, and I said, okay, Lord, I've actually had more than one thing. I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to do this your way. And I, can, and I can't because some of those things are personal, but in each situation, I won the battle. God gave me the victory through Christ Jesus. I want you to read that handout because I don't have time to go through it. But a lot of times, folks, Christians, what we don't understand, we're born again and we're remade in the image of God. We got to learn we do things, op it's just like just the opposite in the kingdom of God. That's why... Uh, Paul says in Romans 8 that the carnal mind, that means the fleshly mind, cannot obey the law of God. He doesn't mean the Mosaic law only. He's not talking about that. The fleshly mind can't obey God. It's hostile toward God. When you're hostile toward God or, you know, you say, well, bless God, you know, I'm not doing that. That's your carnal mind. It's hostile toward God and it can't obey God. But the spiritual mind, the person that's born again, the person that's spiritual can, and he's going to walk in the spirit and God is going to cause that person to triumph in Christ Jesus. Amen. Someone say amen. amen. That's how it works. Read 1 Corinthians 3. Paul said, are you not carnal fleshly people. You're Christians, but he says you're living fleshly. I want to teach you how to win. You can win the spiritual battles you're in. You don't have, God's not a loser. You think Jesus lost when he died on the cross? You're here. That proves Jesus won. We've got a church, I don't know how many are here this morning. That Bible says for the glory that was set, for the glory that was set before him, he endured the shame of the cross, Right? We know he was raised from the dead. We know he's at the right hand of power. We know because he humbled himself above everyone that God exalted him into the highest place. The same promise is given to you that if you humble yourself, God will exalt you too. So there's no way if you humble yourself, if you walk in the spirit, that you can lose. And I don't know what winning looks like in your life. I know some people, God honored them and they got to become martyrs. And that's an honor. Very few people get that honor of being a martyr. But the Word of God says that if we fight with spiritual weapons, he says, the, the Word says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So church, would you stop, if you are, I, knew, I know I do sometimes, stop fighting in the flesh. That's why you're not getting the victory. Amen. Faith is a weapon. In fact, if you don't believe God, if you don't believe in God, you don't believe God, you will not, and that just shows it when you don't employ spiritual weapons, it shows that you don't believe God because you think you have a better chance of success of fighting the battle out of your own power, your own ability, your own strength, and your own weapons. If you are fighting with your husband or wife, trying to get your way or trying to do this, that means you really don't believe that if you do what God says, that you'll get the victory in your marriage and your situation. You're still trying to fix it yourself. You're through, through the flesh. That's honestly what giving is about. When you believe God, you trust God, you give God a portion of what you have because you know that God is your source. Someone say amen. amen. It's a good time to shout right there. I told you my, my testimony about when the Lord told me recently to give a certain amount of money, and I did, and God blessed me for it. When you know that God is who he says he is, and he's going to do what he says he's going to do, you can do what God tells you to do. You can be, I, me personally, right now, if I had a financial, something came on me, a big financial need, like all of a sudden I owe $10,000 or something, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write a check and give it to somebody. I don't have $10,000. 
It's as, you might as well tell me it's a million dollars. I don't have to. Your pastor doesn't have $10,000. And so if I had a $10,000 bill come in my way, I'd grab my checkbook and say, Lord, who do I write a check to? Because I am going to trust you in this situation. I am going to fight a physical battle with a spiritual weapon. Devil's trying to rob from me, so I'm going to give. The devil's lying about me, so I'm going to bless that person. Someone's doing evil to me, so I'm going to do good to that person. They're slandering me, so I'm going to say something good about them. Amen? That's how we fight in the flesh, and it even goes into prayer. You get a demon of unbelief or a, a smoking devil attacks you at night. You get up and you beat that smoking devil in prayer in the morning. If you smoke, I love you. I'm not trying to get on you. How do you overcome fear? Anybody ever been, have fear in their life? It's through faith. I find the best thing to do, do to fear is walk right at it, like it's a Goliath. Charlie, you ever been afraid of something? I know you got a lot of responsibility. You're a coach. You know, you have fear. You walk right at it. it. Boom, you just go right. You do the opposite. You may be trembling and shaking. You may, you, your hand may be shaking, but faith is going to walk right at that Goliath. Through action and through motion, we can overcome. But those are spiritual weapons. I'm going to read you these scriptures. Folks, you are, if you gave your life to Jesus, you're in a spiritual battle, whether you believe it. And I'm not, look, you may not want to grow. In your heart of hearts, you do want to grow. If you've given your life to Jesus, you do want to grow. You want to taste the grapes. You want to see some victory. If you've given your life, you know you do. You get smacked and you don't know how to fight. God wants you to win the battle that you're in. Paul did say, God always causes me to triumph in Christ, didn't he? Didn't he say that? Look, look at this. The word says in Romans 8, 29 and 30, for whom he foreknew, wow, I can't believe it's 12 o'clock. Is it really 12 o'clock? It can't be. I had just my introduction. <laughs> for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. I just want you to know I'm not making this stuff up. That he might be the firstborn among what? Many what? Girls, you're a brethren, sorry. The firstborn, Jesus is the firstborn of what? Many brethren. Uh, man, you could go a long way with that. I, I don't want to scare you guys to death. First John says, when we see him as he is, we will be what? Just like him. It starts now. It starts today. Jesus cast out devils. Jesus healed the sick. Jesus believed God till the very bitter end. Jesus didn't back down. Jesus was a lover. Jesus was faithful. Jesus was full of joy. He was kind. Jesus wasn't selfish. And get this, he says, many brethren... These he also, and there's a whole list of things he did. These he also what? Glorified. Glorified. And there's tons of scriptures. That whole book, can I see that book, Jace? By Arthur Blassett. He's the guy that's carried the cro cross. No, yeah, can I have it back? These are the, I, got, I could talk about having integrity. This guy's carried a cross all over the world. He had a vision of the glory of God. There's books full of scriptures on glory. You can't believe how many scriptures are in the New Testament and really the old that says God is bringing you to glory. Glory. Read Ephesians 1. The riches of his glory. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 1, that, or 2 Thessalonians 1, that God is going to be glorified in his saints. It tells the elders that do a good job, you're going to get a crown of glory. And it all comes from Jesus. I know, I know we don't get it. I know where the glory goes, folks. But we are partakers of his what? Glory. We go from glory to right, when we are transformed into his image. And it has nothing to do with self-righteousness or self-exaltation. It's when we humble ourselves, fight the spiritual battle like Jesus did when we become like Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 2 says that Jesus is our example 
that we should follow in his steps. Yeah, good job, Jeff. And in his, in his steps, we can follow in his steps. He's our model. He's the one that we're supposed to follow. The, the word says that as Jesus is in the world, so are we. We're just like, that's, we are, we are, God's purpose for you is for you to be a chip off the old block. You're not a second class citizen. You're a first class citizen. You are a chip off the, every one of you. We get so caught up in our life, our trials, our limitations, our mental mindset that we don't allow God to reveal who he really is in us. You're a chip off the old block. As he is, so are you in this world. And as we renew our mind to it, and as we dare to live that it's true, things begin to happen in our lives. Now, I know me, myself, so I'm honestly, and, and I'm not judging a person in this congregation, because I think I'm about that far along the road. And the road is pretty long, and I think I'm about that far along the road. But I know where I'm heading. I know the direction I'm going. I know what I want, and I know I'm going after it. Is there anything wrong with wanting to be, live like Jesus? My brother was sending me stuff. Well, well, sorry, I didn't want to mention my brother, but someone sent me stuff talking about the book of Enoch and watchers. And I said, you know, that's all cool. I get around people that are into that stuff. It's okay. You know, I don't ever notice people grow when they get into that stuff. I just don't. But, but, but I love him. You know, I said, I've been into it. I've done some research into that. But I'll tell you what I'm into. God's been telling me and showing me uh, that Christ lives in me, and I want to be more like Jesus. That's what I'm after. You can study the Watchers, and you can study the, read the book of Enoch, and try to figure, and that's okay. I mean, seriously, it's, it's interesting. You can study the Nephilim, and, and all that. That's interesting stuff. There's nothing wrong with it, studying the Nephilim, but you know what? I've never seen anybody grow a lot by going to a Nephilim conference. We had, I'm sorry, I know, I know my time's up. We had, we were down, downtown Newark one time, and we had a, all these tents up. They had a car show, and we had a prayer booth. Sister Carrie Covey was involved in it, and she preached here one time. And we were praying for people. We were inviting people in, come to our prayer. We gave them cookies and apple. We were having a great time. People were coming, and I know that's why I'm born, to pray for people. I did it this week. I'll do it next week. I'm going to do it again. I was born to pray for people. I was born to walk up to people and say, do you know Jesus? That's why I'm alive. I know that, and I don't always do it. I get scurred like you guys do, but when I'm doing well, I do it. But when I was down there, I was doing my job, doing what Jesus called me to do. And all of a sudden, I noticed all these people going into the coffee shop, and they're getting in my line. I need a cup of coffee. There's about 30 of them. So what are you guys doing here? They look like good people. They're nice. Oh, we're here at the Nephilim conference. I'm like, what? I said, we're here. We're learning about the Nephilim. And I go, well, it sounds interesting, you know. And I said to the Lord, I said, God, thank you that I'm down here winning souls and sharing Christ. Because I sure like doing this better than going to a Nephilim conference. You, you may know what the Nephilim are. The sons of God, they married, the, people argue about it. and they, I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I might look at it sometimes. But it's not my passion and it's not my focus. Nothing wrong with it. It's interesting, I grant you. My passion and focus is what God's focused on is to bring many sons to glory. It's for you to look like Jesus. It's for you to look like Jesus. It's for you. Then if you run into a Nephilim, you'll know what to do with them. I'll tell you what, Jesus, I'll tell you what David did to a Nephilim. Da when David ran into a Nephilim, he knew what to do. He wouldn't study him. He took a rock and he threw it right in that Nephilim's forehead and knocked him over. And he chopped his head off. Not that we do that now. Right? That's, we don't do that anymore. We're, I guess we met a Nephilim. If it was a Nephilim, might have to. He'd have to have a big sign on his forehead. Nephilim. Christ in you, the hope of glory. God crowned man with what? What are we crowned with in creation? Glory and, someone even mentioned honor today. Glory and honor. And I don't have time to get into it. Those last two verses talks about the reality that we will bear the image of the heavenly He's really talking about our physical bodies. We already bear the image of the heavenly. Those last two verses say that one day we're going to bear the image of Jesus. We're going to have glorified bodies. Amen? 
You don't have to come to the pastor to uh, get prayer or go to your friend to get prayer. You don't have to have creaks and aches and, and you know, all these different things that happen. No more bad dreams at night. We're going to bear the image physically too. Meanwhile, because our bodies are still corrupt, God keeps us patched together. Amen? Amen. We can stand by faith for people. So what I want to do, and I know some of you might have to leave because I overstate, it's 5 after 12. Can we have the band come up? If you have to slip out, honestly, there's no condemnation. I, I don't want to, once we get up here and get going, I won't, I'm not going to judge you for that. But I want to pray for people. I had, I had, I don't know if what I saw in, when I was worshiping, it looked like two kidneys. What are those things when they're connected, they come out like a pod in your body? Is that kidneys? Is that what they are? I saw, I saw uh, kidneys or something like that. Anybody having trouble with their kidneys? Internal organs. I want to pray for you. You can come up. Huh? What did you say? Do you know somebody? Okay. Kidney problems? And what? Okay. I want to, I want to pray for that. I want to pray for um, Linda's granddaughter, which I'm going to pray for. I want to pray for Delena. Yeah. Your mom's, would you come up and stand for your mom? I saw, I think, I'm pretty sure it was kidneys that I saw. A little vision, plop, came like that. Anybody else? Your mom's really struggling with it? Yeah, when, when we call, just come up. And also, I want to say this. If you've never given your life to Jesus, you can come up and everybody will think it's your kidneys. No, I'm just kidding. If you've never given your life to Jesus and you want to give your life to Jesus, we're going to sing a, a, a verse or two. You can come up and give your life to Jesus and you can pray with us. Why don't we go ahead and stand? What are we going to sing? Simple gospel. Simple gospel. Why don't you go ahead and stand up? If you have, need prayer for anything, internal organs specifically or anything, and if you've never given your life to Jesus, the altar is open. If you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, if you need some type of restoration in your life, Last week I had a word about jobs. If you need prayer for your job, I had a word I wanted to pray for you last week. I didn't get to pray for you. I want to pray for you and your job too. So the altar's open. We start singing. Please come.